So yeah, I'm super grateful and happy to have Sarah Kai Ramsey today with me in the interview. Who she is and what she does, she can explain to you personally in one second. But before we get started, I would like to know from you, what did you have for breakfast this morning? Ooh, I had, I'm still working on it. I had smart coffee, which is not even coffee. It's actually mushrooms and lion's mane and all kinds of good stuff for your brain. Uh, and a handful of almonds, which is my breakfast every morning. It helps regulate my blood sugar throughout the day and prevent sugar spikes. Uh, actually changed my life. That's a funny thing to start with because it's like, man, those almonds in the morning uh, changed my life. I have lots of diabetes in my family. Um, and I found it was the best way to regulate my blood sugar throughout the day and not reach for those cookies or ice cream late at night. <laughs> mm, wonderful. Yeah, yes. I've heard of this coffee actually, but I've never really tried it. Um, mm -hmm. I think imagining mushrooms in a coffee, it doesn't sound so appealing to me. Does it taste good or is it actually kind of like you have to try to chug it down? No, no, it's, it's, it's fine. It's good. It, it, it's, um, almost has chocolate undertones, you know, it's almost, mm -hmm. it's not a hot chocolate. It's not, but it's not coffee either. But, um, you know, the health benefits, the immune system, brain benefits, uh, supposed to help curb appetite throughout the day. So you're not snacking as much. And it's my appetite and my hunger is significantly stronger when I just have regular coffee rather than that in the morning, I've noticed. So it's a good mm. little mental and um, for, your, for your brain and your waistline. So. Highly recommend, <laughs> highly recommend to try it. And I have the vanilla creamer too, which has uh, collagen in it. Mm, wow, it sounds like, like such a health treat. I used to work as a barista, so um, ah. that would be a coffee violation somehow. For yes, me. it would, yeah, <laughs> but, uh, yeah. As an extra, maybe I would give it a shot. Yeah, yes. thank you for that. Thank you for sharing. Um, so yeah, I was already saying that, uh, promising that you would uh, introduce yourself. I think you probably introduce yourself best. And so please tell us who is Sarah and what are you currently up to and working on? So I'm a toxic relationship specialist. Okay. So what that means is I truly believe I help the world's most amazing women remember how amazing they are. If you've had a toxic relationship, you've had somebody in your head, they get in your heart, they make you feel small, they make you feel confused. It could be a coworker, a friend, a parent, a whoever. We think about it in terms of romantic relationships, but uh, we really do ourselves a disservice when we only think about it in context of romantic relationships. And so I help women reconnect with what's right with them, become toxic person proof, and design lives they're excited about living. Mm, so important, I think. And I love that you said, I help them remember because that implies that um, we already know actually from the inside and we maybe forget over the time. So we, we come back to remembering. Would you say it's highly connected with the intuition? Oh, yes. And women turn off their intuition when they want to make excuses for bad behavior. And we've all done it. This is not coming from a judgmental place. This is coming from a, I had to learn this the hard way place, right? I, I learned this and it hurt my own life. And I was intuitive and I picked up on something and I thought, oh, you're being too hard on them. Oh, you should believe the best in people. Oh, they probably didn't mean it. Oh, well, you have bad days too. And you start to make all these real excuses. Uh, Sandra L. Brown uh, is a famous author and expert in this area. And she told me personally, she said, we make loopholes in our brain. You know, well, but it's my mom. Well, but you know, they had a bad childhood and we start to make these loopholes in our brain that end up creating situations where we ignore our intuition and fall into toxic situations. Hmm. Um, and what do you, why do you think it's so um, specially focused for women? Do men have this problem as well? Or um, is it something that women are for some reason most likely to behave like? So it usually ends up looking really different. There are absolutely toxic men and absolutely toxic women. Most of the time, 
toxic men tend to power over. Okay, it's a more controlling, more um, overt, more strength-based toxicity. Okay, they want to get their way. They want to be selfish. They want to play by a different set of rules. They're absolutely toxic women, and they tend to play the victim. Okay, I have dear friends who I'm friends with who've been in these types of situations, right? So they have a female who, and it's so tricky because there are women who have been victims and then there are people who play the victim, you know? We have to have this wisdom, use our intuition and our wisdom to know the difference. Uh, you know, situations where women get in a relationship and then immediately like quit their jobs. And I'm saying, why? She hasn't known you for a month. Why is she quitting her job and expecting you to take care of her? You know, that would be a bad sign. It would also be a bad sign if you'd been in them with a guy for a month and all of a sudden he's controlling your schedule or you feel confused around him. It shows up in different ways and you can have controlling women and you can have men who play the victim. But in a more general pattern, that's more typical. Mm. Um, so you were already bringing up a few examples of toxic relationships, but sometimes when we're in it, I think it's really difficult to see that we're in a toxic relationship. So how do I know if I'm in a toxic relationship or not? How can I find out? So the best way to think about this is in terms of patterns, okay? There's a huge difference in a dog who bites you once and a dog who bites you every day, right? We all have bad days. We all say things we shouldn't mean, or we all say things we didn't mean. We all say things we shouldn't say. We probably, most of us have raised our voice at some point in a relationship or did something that we had to apologize for, but it's about the pattern of behavior, okay? Um, so look at how often these things are happening. And the more often they are happening, the more likely it is that the relationship is toxic. Also, I want people to look out for the flip, okay? The flip, okay? If you're in a toxic relationship, you go to this person with a problem. I don't want to come at two o'clock on Christmas. I want you to watch the kids on Thursday. Um, I wish you wouldn't text that girl, whatever the situation is, and they flip it. And all of a sudden you are on defense. You are having to defend yourself. You are feeling as if you did something wrong. You are feeling confused. You are wondering why they always seem to get their way. Because in a toxic relationship, both people do not play by the same set of rules. One person is usually winning. And that's especially important if you get out of these relationships and you, you ask yourself, was I the toxic one? Okay, because you feel bad. You think, oh, I wasn't perfect either. And I did these things that I shouldn't have. And I say, who was getting the better end of the deal? And that's usually pretty easy to see. You know, the example I used with my friend, you know, he was in, he actually left his wife for this woman. She kind of seduced him. He was married for all these years. She seduced him. And uh, then as soon as she, he was very well off, and as soon as he left his wife, his kids would no longer talk to him. And as soon as he left his wife, he, um, she quit her job, right? That's very like subtle behavior, but you see kind of a pattern developing. And the pattern is she, his life is being destroyed and her life is getting better, mm. right? She's getting a better end of the deal. She's winning. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, in a male perspective, right? I've even heard stories as interesting as, you know, he gets to be angry, you don't get to be angry. He gets to set your schedule, you don't get to set your schedule. He gets to have friendships or romantic relationships with other women, you, yet he's very jealous and you're not even allowed to talk to other men. There's a very different standard and different set of rules happening and one person's getting very much so the better end of the deal. Mm. 
Um, do you think it's it's possible to have a balanced relationship though? Because I feel often in relationship in different per time periods, there's always, uh, it comes and goes in waves. And sometimes, I mean, one person is always the one that is in power. And, but sometimes it changes like the um, pattern, the power pattern behaviors change. Would you say it is possible or have you examples where both of them are always nonstop on, on the same level and you go equal through the relationship and life? Well, I'm very fortunate to be living in one of those relationships, my husband now, oh. <laughs> uh, but I talk about it in terms of the top of the pyramid. Okay, so say there's like a, a pyramid. We, uh, in the U.S., we had that we had the old food pyramid right at the bottom. It was like breads, and then you know. So I want you to think about in pyramid and family structures and partnerships are within that pyramid. Okay, if you have a child who won the baseball game, or soccer game, or football game, or whatever it is, they're probably on the top of the pyramid that night. If a, if a child wins the game, you ask that child, "Where would you like to go to dinner?" What would you like to do tonight? They become at the top of the pyramid. They become the kind of most important person in that situation. If you have a child who's sick, the family structure starts to revolve around the child who's sick. They get to be at the top of the pyramid. If you have one partner who's having a huge launch at work, they're probably at the top of the pyramid, which means as a healthy partner, you're going to take on, let me take care of the dishes tonight. Let me get dinner ready. Let me handle that. Okay. And, um, But then it take turn, you take turns. You see how whoever is at the top of the pyramid rotates. Uh, like it's very unhealthy for anyone to be at the top of the pyramid, whether it be the child always at the top of the pyramid, you know, the man, the female, the other female, whatever it is, right? Um, it's, we, it's so simple. Like when we very first go to school, we learn how to take turns. In a healthy relationship, you are taking turns with that position of power, with being at the top of the pyramid. Mm. So now if we realize we are in a toxic relationship because someone has power over us or we are constantly in the power and we don't feel comfortable in that, um, do you think there is a chance of, of healing or going through the process? Because maybe if you're already a long time in that position, it's so um, stuck or... I think you cannot expect your partner to change, obviously, and maybe you don't want to change. Um, so is always breaking up or leaving the, the option or are there any other option how we can continue if we realize we're in a toxic relationship? So the studies around this, there are some experts who believe that their brains are that way. Like, you know, back in like when psychology was first being created, We did not have brain scans to go off of. Now when we are looking at brain scans, there are people who are less empathetic than others, right? When you see their brain, it looks different than someone who is kind and empathetic and intuitive and, 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 and really those things. Not somebody who says they're those things to try to get you to let your guard down, but just um, has a, a nature about them that is kind and generous and willing to take turns and unselfish and willing to put their partner's needs above their own and within that context but then you have people like there's uh, in the book the five types of people who will ruin your life he says one in ten people have a true personality disorder the chances of them changing are shockingly shockingly low sandra l brown i think i mentioned her before uh she uh is a has worked in uh psych psychopathy is that what she calls it uh, but she's been working with these people for um you know 33 years and she now calls those clinics uh the, have not had all my coffee right i think you've come up with my own words um, <laughs> she has clinics and she calls them babysitting services now she says the chances of changing someone's brain structure is like saying If I'm good enough, if I'm loving enough, if I'm forgiving enough, if I'm kind enough, then I can turn brown eyes blue. It, we can't do that. Like we cannot turn brown eyes blue by being so kind and forgiving and working on ourselves. A few other experts do not hold quite to that, to that extreme um, and would say people can change if they want to. 
the chances of someone wanting to change and if they've been getting the better end of the deal forever and they have been able to avoid responsibility and able to manage their image and able to offload, push, push their junk on you, push their mess on you. And then I hear in, in this case, like women, um, and they'll say, oh, but, you know, I thought they would love me enough to want to change. And that can be a toxic parent, toxic sibling, toxic partner. I thought they would love me enough to want to change. And we try to become so lovable that they want to change, right? Or that they would want to change. And we get in this really unhealthy cycle of becoming more lovable, of working harder. Remember, I talked about doing the work of the relationship. In either situation, one partner is always doing the work of the relationship and one person is always doing the, getting the better end of the deal. And so really, when you look at the pattern, and one person's always getting their way and they're always finding a way to be selfish and to avoid responsibility, the chances of them changing, all the experts agree that the chances of them wanting to change, truly wanting to change and doing the work of owning up to things, not pushing blame is just very unlikely. And, and it's not because you're not lovable, it's because they are not good at loving. And to some people, love is connection. And to other people, love is control. So when you're even talking about like what love is, you're not even speaking the same language. You know, you're from Germany, I'm from the U.S., right? If you're speaking German right now, we could like, uh, we would be really struggling, <laughs> you know, we would be really, st- you. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Uh, I could, if you were speaking French, I could, I could do a little better, uh, but uh, not German, right? Um, the, uh, so you see, it's like a different language. If love is control or love is connection, those are two different languages that you're not going to be talking. So it's not going to work. Even if I was like, oh, but I'm going to speak like really clear English and you're going to speak really clear German. I'm going to be just smiling and lovable when you do, like, you know, like it doesn't matter because we're speaking a different language. Mm. Do you by, are you by any chance familiar with um, the book, The Five Love Languages? Yes, yes, oh. yes. I actually wrote a book called The Five Love Languages or The Love Language of the Narcissist which is what this is talking about. If anyone's familiar with the five love languages, um, what is their love language? Getting you to do the work of the relationship. Can you lose a few words on on the five love languages and maybe also you will get into it with your book because I think it's really interesting how people show love in such different way that like you were just saying for one person, it's showing all their love, but if the other one has a different perception of that, they cannot really receive it if they don't know about it. So yeah, maybe you can tell. Yeah, that's a great distinction. So um, I have a friend and her love language is acts of service. She wants her husband to help out with things, to fix things, to take out the trash, to take care of things. Her husband's love language is words of affirmation. Every day he tells her she's so beautiful, she's so sexy, he could not live without her. And they've been together for a long time. This is not early on in their relationship. They've had children, they've been together, you know, 15 years or something like that, you know. So he is still saying these things to her every day. And he's thinking he loves her well. And she's frustrated because he's not taking out the trash. So she's not giving him kind words of affirmation back. She's fussing at him, right? So it creates this dynamic um, where they are speaking two different languages to some extent, but they are both trying to love each other in their language. Okay. Uh, Gifts is another love language. Um, Quality time and physical touch. I have another friend, hers is physical touch. You know, her husband's out of town or something. She feels very unloved uh, because that's her love language. His is um, gifts, I think. So he'll come home and bring her a present. She's like, I don't, I just, I don't want a present. I want a hug. 
Okay, so you can see where that's a miscommunication issue. That is very different than one person always getting the better end of the deal. Okay, so, so that, those are miscommunication issues within a healthy dynamic. Okay, someone thinking they can flip everything to make everything your fault. Um, in, within the love language of a narcissist, I say the finish line is always moving. They're like, I need you to run here, run. I need you to run here, run. And then as soon as you get there, the finish line's moved. Run, finish line's moved. Run, finish line's moved. Okay, so their love language is watching you work to do the, all the work of the relationship. So that's what they like. But that's exhausting for the other person because you never get to a place where it's your turn. You never get to a place where you're able to rest. You never get to a place where you're okay. And so it doesn't work. Yeah. Yeah, I think going back to the five love languages, I think um, even if you're different, it can work when you know sure. what the other person like how the other person is behaving and why. And then I think it can actually be quite nice to have different love languages because then you can learn from the other and maybe adapt a little bit of their love language. And then you basically have two love languages in one relationship, which can be nice if both of them are working on it. Um, but as I know, um, when people choose their partners, um, me included, most people have um, a type. Not yes not necessarily from the outside, but more so from the behaviors, from their way of being, from, yeah, just who they are as a person. And also the problems that come up in a relationship keep on repeating because in my opinion, life gives you a task as long as you, until you solve the problem inside of you to show you where your problem is. And then, because if you constantly choose let's say someone chooses um, a guy that gets really aggressive all the time. Um, and she will get to guys like this until she has done her inner work. So she can choose a partner that suits her actually better and doesn't get aggressive anymore. Um, so how can we, if we're in a toxic relationship, supposedly we have a pattern that we choose someone who is maybe not so good for us. What can we do to not come, always repeat this pattern, but get out of there? There's a more complicated answer and there's a very simple answer. And I'll give, I'll give you both because in the healing world, we talk a lot about the complicated answer, right? We talk about um, resetting normal. We talk about doing our inner child work. We talk about, you know, connecting what would happen to patterns in our, with our parents. Um, we, we talk about a lot of those things, okay? A very simple, and those things are important, right? Resetting your nervous system, having better boundaries, um, you know, those things are very important. And the best way to not be in a toxic relationship is to stop putting up with toxic behavior. And in the States, we have, in the old, like old stories, like from like 50 years ago, it's not really now, but they would, they would have stories in neighborhoods about the stray cat. So there's a cat that comes in and um, they're, you know, cause when they used to have like milk, like set out at the doorway, like the milkman would come and drop the milk at your house before we had milk in stores and whatnot. Um, and the stray cats would come. And if you, and there was a saying that said, your mama would say, don't feed the neighborhood cat because then the cats will keep coming. If you stop feeding the need for control, the need for aggression, the need for playing by a different set of rules, the need for always getting the better end of the deal, then you, it's, they, don't, they don't stay. If you don't feed the cat, the cats stay away. But the cats will keep coming because the cats are hungry. And that's where we get a little bit wrong um, is that we think we can stop attracting stray cats, okay? We'll use that language, right? We want to stop attracting stray cats. But if you are a good, kind, loving, empathetic person and agreeable, everyone likes you. Toxic people will like you too. 
Those traits of being agreeable and conscientious is a fabulous employee. Being agreeable and conscientious is a fabulous friend. Being agreeable and conscientious is a fabulous partner. Being agreeable and conscientious is a great person for the toxic people to find because you will be more forgiving. You'll put up with bad behavior longer. You will internalize it and say, well, it's probably my fault. You will self-analyze and work on yourself rather than forcing them to work on themselves. You are a perfect person for toxic people to find you. The cat is hungry. The cat is hungry. You've got to stop feeding the cat. And there's lots of ways to stop feeding the cat. You know, okay, what happened? But so often it's just, we kind of, I see women a lot of times and they get into, they almost kind of become like self-help junkies, you know, addicted to self-help um, and addicted to healing. It's like, oh, I need to work on my inner child. I need to work on my PTSD. And, and those things can be true. And then you also just need to say, I don't let people treat me that way. We're done. Like it's that simple, like that sentence. And I know it's not that simple when you had, you know, the earlier you do it, the more simple it is, right? If you're doing it after five kids and 30 years and, <laughs> and all that kind of stuff, I, I don't mean to minimize it in any way. Um, but the quicker you set those boundaries, um, it is a real danger. It, it's an oddly dangerous belief that we have that if you give someone enough time, they change. We probably don't even see it that much in our real lives, but our movies, our songs, our stories tell us that if you just give that beast enough time, he's going to turn into a handsome prince. If you just stick it out, they'll choose you. They'll leave that other girl and choose you. We got a lot, and then we want to be nice. It doesn't seem nice to say, well, people don't usually change. Mm. But when you think about the people in your life, you know, there are some people who change. There, there are, there are, there's some people who grow up, right? But if you're trying to get a 45 year old man to grow up and change, like he's already, he, he's already formed. Like his personality's already formed. His brain structure's already formed. His experiences have already formed. And we live in a world where if people want to be better, they can't. Did he really not know how to Google how to be a better boyfriend? Did he really not know how to, like, that's not true. So lying to ourselves, like, oh, well, he's had a bad childhood, so I just need to love him more. That that would be the male victim, right? Like the male victim, like, oh, he had a really hard time in childhood. So if I just love him big enough, he's never been loved well. He's never been loved well. And that, and it's so sad because those are, those are good, kind pieces of us. Yeah. It's being loving. It's being empathetic. It's being kind. It's believing the best in people. These are wonderful qualities that I want my women to keep. I just don't want those qualities to be taken advantage of. Hmm. Yeah, it's always it's it's a balance, I think, and yes. it takes some also some consideration um, to decide how long you want to stay or how long you want to give the person a try and then also realizing okay maybe that person is not going to change anymore and then accepting it I think a good way of practicing this is um, with our parents because obviously we wish that maybe our parents would be different in some certain ways but um, the older you get the more you realize that your parents usually don't really change anymore and either you accept them like they are or you cut the contact because that's all that your ability, your op options are in this moment. So yeah, but let's well, say even chill. Oh, if I may tag on that just a little bit, even children, you know, um, we have ch children can change to some extent, but for the most part, if you have a very very musical child and try to get them to morph into an athlete, it hardly ever works, right? If you have a very athletic child and try to make a musical, that's a very simple you know, a very, very introverted child, and then you make them extroverted. Like there are, it's like a 1% like uh, chance of like, well, you know, they used to be really quiet and now they're not. But for the most part, people are who they are. And there's a lot of genetic background 
that says that people and we that people are who they are from birth and we don't think about it in terms of like um some people are naturally more talkative and some people are naturally not as talkative okay we we, we all can agree on that but then when you start saying some people are born more selfish than others people start going oh i don't know because we don't want to believe it we don't want to believe it yet if i said give me some examples of children do you think you know they're more selfish than other people and for the most part they're still selfish when they're 45 compared to uh other kids right it just it just is uh, yeah, and as you it just is that people have different um characteristic or different traits um some theories say that it's good to have a partner who is very similar than you and some others say that it's really good to have someone who's really different in order to balance you out i'm wondering what is your perspective on that so i am very extroverted my husband is very extroverted my type which about types earlier i love having someone responsible I love someone who's a little bit of a workaholic. I, I even double booked this call when we originally did. I love working. I love what I do. I want someone who's passionate about what they do. If I had someone who was just like, wanted to watch TV all day or play video games or what, you know, I would just, ugh, you know, so in some ways, um, my husband and I are very similar. Um, and in other ways, we are very different. He's much more athletic than me. He's better at numbers and boxes and I'm better at creative ideas. You know, he's creative too. He's, he's really wonderful. But you know, that, that complements each other. But I think we get too messed up when I hear people say, oh, they're great for each other. They both like the same kind of beer. They both like the same sports teams. They both like the same movies. And we, we have in our head that any of that matters, right? And so it's important that you have someone you like to do some things with but really, when you think about um, aligning values, you know, aligning work ethics, aligning, uh, you know, um, ways to function in the house, if you're super messy and they're super clean, you'll be fighting about that forever. Um, but the best example I had of this is someone said in every relationship, you need a rock and a star. And you better know which one you are. <laughs> Right. Uh, and so I see a lot of women who should be stars and could be stars and they just keep trying to shine it under the, they just keep kind of bury themselves under the rock because um, he's jealous or gets mad. And it's really sad to see. Mm, yeah. Um, so let's say um, we've been in a very toxic relationship and we managed to get out of there, we finished it, um, but I'm sure it leaves behind some, like some marks or some traces and some deep wounds. What are some good tips and tricks to heal from toxic relationship? So the biggest thing about healing from a toxic relationship is know what you were trying to heal from. I do yoga and meditation already today. I've done both of those things. I love those things. But when I ask someone, if you want to slow down your nervous system and connect with your body, yoga is amazing for that. If you want to get clarity in your mind about what your future goals are, meditation is amazing for that. If you are trying to figure out what are the red flags, why you ignored the red flags, um, why you put up with that. What is a healthy relationship look like? Yoga cannot teach you what a healthy relationship looks like. It doesn't mean it's bad. It's wonderful. I did it today. I love it. I mean, I love, 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 love yoga. But I see so many women particularly, and they're like, I said, what are you doing to try to heal? Oh, I'm reading the books about confidence. Okay, that's a piece of the puzzle. That's a piece of the puzzle, but you really need a program. My Wonders Woman program is structured in a way made in three pieces. You first, you reconnect what's right with you. I believe in strength-based healing. Codependency is an overused term. There are women who are codependent. Not everyone who is in a toxic relationship is codependent, okay? You also need to figure out how your strengths have been used against you, such as your kindness, your willingness to forgive, your willingness to give people the benefit of the doubt, okay? Those have been used against you. 
yoga will not prevent you from that being used against you in the future. And honestly, there's hardly even a book I can give you that, that I'm, I'm working on mine right now. So, and that's the premises of that. There's a ton of information out there about what, like who toxic people are, not as much information out there about how really and truly how to make sure you're not in another toxic relationship. Because at some point your life has to be about you again. Yeah. Not healing from the toxic relationship, getting help for the toxic relationship. Because then like uh, for the video people, I'm putting my hand up like at the, the, the microphone, right? And then the, the screen, the camera. And so all you can see is my hand and all you can see is the toxic person. And if you can only see the toxic person, your life will always be about the toxic person, even if you're not with them anymore. Yeah. And so your healing strategy should walk you through that toxic person junk. But the final baseline is getting you back to you again. So reconnecting with what's right with you. The second piece, becoming toxic person proof so you don't end up in the situation again. And the third piece, designing a life you're excited about living because it's when you feel alive again. You know, there's nothing about toxic relationships that make you feel alive. You know, it's just awful. But, but reconnecting with you, reconnecting with your joy, reconnecting with your vigor, reconnecting with the light inside of you and, and feeling alive and bringing that version of you who now doesn't ignore red flags, who now knows what's happening and they've, they've been able to uncover the game and bringing that version of you into your career into parenting, into dating, into, you know, whatever is next. But, but there needs to be a next. I say get past the past, get real about the present, so you can get serious about your future. Mm, yeah, yeah, I think reflecting on it and finding out what it was that it made it so toxic is really like a good tool. And then mm -hmm. really finding peace with yourself because I think so many people um, are clinging onto a partner or searching fulfillment and love and happiness within their partner um, but in my opinion it starts with yourself like you just said yes. like bring back the joy into your life without a relationship first and then the relationship can follow I think it's so important to have already the life that you want without needing that partner for that um, so we were just talking a lot about romantic relationships, but as you were saying in the beginning, it's about relationships in general. So what do we do, for example, if we have a really rela a toxic relationship with a working colleague or maybe with our boss or something, uh, some place where it's a bit harder to get out there without <laughs> needing to quit the job? What can we do in our everyday life when we encounter toxic people where we cannot go out of the way? Is there any way of protecting ourselves? Um, a bit, right? So I want you to think about the, the, the story of the uh, three little pigs. Are you familiar with the story of the three little pigs? No. You've not heard the story? Of the, oh, okay. I'll tell you the story of the three little pigs. There was a big bad wolf, okay? And three little pigs. And the big bad wolf was going to come. And the first little pig built a house made out of straw. But the big bad wolf huffed and he puffed and he blew it down. The second little pig built a house out of sticks. He tried to have better boundaries, right? Which when the conversation on toxic relationship is about better boundaries. And so then the house built of sticks, which is stronger than straw. But the big bad wolf huffed and he puffed and he blew the house down. The third little pig said, oh no, no, I'm not gonna do this. And he built a house full of bricks and it was strong and it was like a fortress. And you know, he, the big bad wolf came and he huffed and he puffed. He could not blow the house down, okay? So that's a great conversation around boundaries, which is typically like what that answer would be. It's like, oh, toxic relationship, you need better boundaries. What does better boundaries mean anyway? But I want to make it, the point of the three little pigs is one had a boundary of straw, one had a boundary of sticks, and one had a boundary of bricks. None of those boundaries changed who the big bad wolf was. Better boundaries do not make better wolves. And that is a really important piece that we get wrong in the conversation around boundaries. So I say that just to have the conversation around, there are ways we can protect ourselves, right? And have those layers of bricks, but not, don't expect those layers of bricks to turn your wolf into a 
a little puppy, <laughs> right? They're not, they're not going to be a little puppy. Um, bring in, well, create space whenever possible. Don't sit by that person. Try not to be in a room by yourself with that person if you cannot. Um, if you can start to create space on how, on how quick you are to respond to that person, right? Don't, <gasps> okay, okay, okay. You know, that creates a really like, um, you're their puppet feeling. Uh, so create space. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna time myself. I'm not gonna respond for an hour. Okay, I'm not gonna respond for two hours. And, and to create that space so you're not their puppet. Um, they can also, like even, you know, going to the bathroom when things get really tense, you know, saying, excuse me, I need 24 hours to think about that. I'll get back to you. Thanks for your patience. I'll get back to you in 24 hours. Those are some ways to create space. It's also important to bring in backup whenever possible, okay? If it's your boss, that's tougher, right? But if it's not your boss, maybe you have a difficult conversation kind of in your shot of your boss so that the person is less likely to respond in ugly ways to you, right? Because they want to look good. They're toxic people are very interested in image management. They want to look good in front of others. If they're wanting to look good in front of others, try to have as much of your interaction with them in front of others rather than alone where they can blow, try to blow your house down. <laughs> But yeah, thank you for sharing these advices. Um, I would like to move on to some a round of quick fire questions for you. Sure. You just answer right from your intuition really quickly. Okay. What can you do for more self-love today? Oh, just be kind to yourself. I know that sounds so cheesy, but um, I've had, I told you, I've had a lot of death and sickness in my family. And, you know, just... Everybody makes mistakes, even grown-ups. And there was a, you know, a mistake I made today. It's just like, well, nobody's perfect, even grown-ups. And just giving that kindness to yourself. Mm, amazing. What's your favorite dish besides the coffee? <laughs> oh, I had a great, in oh, there was an Indian place, a brand new place open five minutes from my house. And I had a, a butter chicken. Oh, it was so good. So it's my favorite thing right now. <laughs> that may change. But last night, these are the best meals I've had. In a long time. My husband said it was the best um, Indian food he'd had since London. So it was just great. Yeah. Mm, amazing. What can you do for better health today? Uh, move your body. Move your body. Um, take breaks, you know, even 10 minutes of kickboxing or whatever before you move on to your next thing um, rather than just never you know sit 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 uh just creating more energy for yourself if you are on a phone call do a walk and talk right even just pacing while you're in that conversation rather than sitting and staring at a screen especially in the world of zoom right now where we're all working on video um whatever possible move yeah so true what's your favorite place on earth oh uh, I, that would be really hard for me to answer. I like um, it's surrounded by people I love. I mean, for sure. But uh, there's a, a beach in Florida that came to mind. We have a we have a condo in Florida, and uh, it's just such a good. The beaches are so white and the water is so clear, and it's just uh, it's a second home, but it feels like going home in a different way. So it's lovely. What is a movie or a book or a podcast that was a game changer for you? Oh gosh, uh, anything by Brene Brown is fabulous. Um, and also the book, Why Does He Do That? Inside the Minds of Angry and Controlling Men by Lundy Bancroft. And if you search Lundy Bancroft with Sarah K. Ramsey, if you Google that, you can see an interview I did with him. Definitely like a big moment in my life to get to interview someone who changed my life, right? Um, but that should be a textbook for like, in, and again, there are women who are toxic too, but it's so good and just so eye-opening. Okay, great. I will order it. <laughs> you should. Every female should read it. Like every female should read it. It's so good. In the show notes. Is there yes. a last piece of advice or anything we didn't talk about which you would shortly like to address? I just want to recap that in healthy relationships, you take turns, right? You take turns at the top of that pyramid. And 
the if it has been someone else's turn for years and years and years and years and you never feel like it's your turn, um, that's, a, that's a really clear sign that you can't really do anything to fix it, that, you know, that it's toxic and, and seems to going to be staying that way. Okay. Yeah, Sarah, thank you so much for being on Pure Happy Healthy. I really enjoyed this conversation and I think there's so much knowledge and information about this. So yeah, that hopefully helps a lot of people don't get in toxic relationships yes. or, and um, uh, when they feel they are. Thank you so much again. Awesome. You're so welcome.